It's Sunday morning, and we are in a study of just a, a number of things that all connect together. There are words in the Bible talking about how men do evil, and uh, there's words that talk about how men are ordained to do right and to be righteous and to be holy and to be godly. These are words that we need to we need to uh, put our minds on holy, righteous, and godly. These are three of my favorite words of what we're supposed to be. Uh, holy is the word hagios. You get some derivative of the word hagios, you get the word Hagiadzo. Then you have the word hagiasmos, H A G I A S M O S. Hagiasmos is the word holiness. Holiness, and the word hagiadzo is the word sanctify, means to set apart, and God doesn't do that one day. He sanctifies us by putting us in the fire. Put us in the fire and the persecution by our enemies. And Haggai is, is the common word holy. Holy. Well, how do these all relate together? The fiery trials is what gets rid of the outer man in each one of us. Paul said, Every one of us has an inner man, which is Christ. Not everybody in the world, but every believer has Christ born in them. And then you have, he said in Romans 7, Romans 7, he said you have an outer man. He said that outer man cannot do right. It serves the flesh. The last couple of verses, that seventh chapter, and the inner man serves Christ. There's a wrestling match going on between the inner and the outer man when you are born again. Don't think you're going to get rid of all your sin at once. The inner man has no sin. That's when the Bible says in 1 John 3 and 9, Whosoever is born of God, which would be the inner man, uh, doth not commit sin. There's no sin in this inner man. That inner man is what gives you conscience whenever you're out there doing something you shouldn't do. And the outer man is just self. It's this fleshly body that wants to continue in this. The longer you live and the more fire you go through, the holier you become. Holiness means to be single. It has the idea of being in a fire and burning out all the impurities of that outer man so that the inner man can take over and rule. Now, I'm a real good example of that. I wanted to be somebody special, and I got in the music world, and, and I battled, and I fought, and I carried on for a long time until God caused me just to pull away from myself and say, Lord, I'm going to live for you. I had a lot of contention and strife, a lot of pride, and the list goes on and on. This is the thing that God has to work on in every believer, this doesn't just go away all of a sudden. There's no way it just leaves you. Does anybody have any pride here? Or do you ever get angry when somebody, those are words you don't need in your life, angry, angry. Uh, I have got all kinds of words up here. You cannot be angry. You cannot have envy in your life. And there's several words for envy. One is the word phothonos, P-H-O-T-H-O-N-O-S. Phothonos means to be ruined. Ruined. It means to think rotten. And sometimes the word, uh, the word is extended uh, to the word. Uh, Dia Fathero, Dia, D-I-A, which is a form of Fothanos, Dia, P-H-E-T-H-E-I-R-O, D-I-A. 
D-I-A means, it means to channel or thoroughly, thoroughly, and dia for thero, D-I-A, P-H, T-H-E-I-R-O. Diphthero means to thoroughly be ruined or to be completely rotten in your thinking. Whenever you are envious, you're rotten in your thinking. You're, not, you're supposed to be satisfied with what God has given you and not be wanting what somebody else has. There's some real good illustrations of this in the Bible. Two men particularly I'm going to talk about one is the word, one is Saul, and then you got Joseph. These, Saul was actually envious of David. He thought David was stealing his kingdom when it was God that transferred the kingdom to David. When you have a gift, or you know somebody's got a gift, and they have an ability, or they have money, or they have talent doing something. You're not supposed to be envious of that. What you're supposed to do is do what you can do in your life and not look at somebody else and say, they're stealing my glory like Saul, Saul was saying. The brothers of Joseph felt the same way. When Joseph was 17, Jacob loved Joseph more than all of his other sons. Jacob became Israel. His name was changed to Israel in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. And his brothers saw that Joseph had been given the coat of authority over there in the book of Genesis, 37th chapter. I want us to go over and I may see Saul back and forth talking about these people and envy and what it'll do to you. Envy will destroy your life. I've had a lot of people come in here. All I can attribute things to is their envy because if I say this, I'm being very serious. I've never done anything in this ministry to intentionally hurt anybody. And I've been accused of intentionally gossiping and ripping people apart, and I've never done that. I don't understand other than the fact that people will be envious you cannot that's something you've got to get out of your life if god hasn't brought you to a place to fulfill the things that you desire in your life to do for him you're going to have to wait they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they'll they'll mount up with wings as eagles they'll run and not be weary they'll walk and not faint you have to wait for god in your life when I was young, in my early 20s, I had no idea where I was going to go, had no idea what I was going to do. And if you had told me when I was 22 or 23 that I was going to be teaching from the Greek text, when I was in my 50s and 60s, I'd have said, you're crazy. I didn't know that was in store for me. You don't ever know what's in store. God has planned everything. We are supposed to be thankful for everything that happens in our life because we are a product of everything that we've done or been through. That's what we are. Now, look over here. In, I'm going to show you a little bit about envy and how men, what they'll do when they're envious. Look here in Genesis 37. Genesis 37. This is what men do when they're envious. All right. Let's read here in verse 1. Let's read a little bit about Joseph. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. That's why I said he was 17. The Bible said he was 17 at this point. Was feeding the flock with his brethren and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah. Now Bilhah was the handmaid of Rachel. And Leah had a handmaid. Now you can find these two with their handmaids back in the 29th and the 30th chapter of Genesis. A handmaid was like a secondary wife in a sense. Uh, and some of the sons of Jacob 
came from Bilhah and Zilpah, the handmaidens, and they were part of Israel. They were the sons of Jacob. With the sons of Zilpah and his father's wife, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. You heard me say that. That's in the Bible. Joseph was his favorite son. He was the eleventh son of Jacob. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. That's not what he made. Colors is a terrible translation. The word is pos, P-A-C. Colors is the word A-Y-I-N in the Hebrew. Ayin means an eye. You actually see when you see things, you don't see shapes. You see a refraction of colors. You see a separation of colors in the retina of your eye. That's what you're seeing. And ayin means an eye. Now, pos was a coat of authority. Whoa. Now, Joseph is 17 years old, and his father gave him the coat of authority. That meant that he was going to rule over his brothers that were in their 40s, their late 30s and 40s. That meant he's going to be the boss. Well, there's nobody better in the Old Testament to be the boss than Joseph. He was more like Christ than anyone else. Now, let's continue reading. And when his brethren saw that his, their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. They were envious of him. Why would he love him most? Would you be jealous enough to be upset at somebody loving somebody else more than you? Your time will come if you're a believer. But you can't say, I don't like it because God put him in authority at this point. Let's keep reading. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more because of the dream. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. They bowed to me. Well, that actually happens in Joseph's life later on when he rises in Egypt to be second in Egypt in charge of everything except Pharaoh's house. And his brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed <coughs> have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more for his dreams and for his words. And they had no right. Because God put him in the position he was in. When you're put in the position by God, he put me in this position here as the pastor. I started this as a Bible class in my house. We had four people when we started. We weren't on TV and we weren't on radio and we didn't make DVDs. We didn't make tapes. It took me a while to even start that. If you knew what somebody goes through it's a terrible thing to be hated by your brothers or be hated by your spiritual brothers it's very depressing but you know it's supposed to be and they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words and he dreamed yet another dream now why would he have two dreams can any uh two witnesses that's right and behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance, made obeisance to me. Now I want you to notice something about the sun, moon, and stars. He's talking about Jacob and his mother and his brethren when he says sun, moon, and stars. So you can use sun, moon, and stars as an example uh, all through the Bible for heads of a family, because right here, he uses it right here. He sets a precedent. A precedent is where something is set, and it's going to hold true all through the Scripture. It's like a precedent is set in law. If you can go to court, 
and your lawyer can find some other case where there was a precedent set, then you can use that in this case. You can use the fact that he's talking about Jacob's, he's talking about Joseph's mother and father and brothers. And he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and my mother, thy mother and thy brethren, indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee in the earth? Exactly they will, because he's going to be out of envy and jealousy. His brothers are going to sell him into Egypt. He didn't have anything to do with this. He didn't have anything to do with his father loving him more than his brothers, did he? No. He didn't have anything to do with being special in his father's eye, but he was special. And Joseph was as special as anybody. He meets the criteria of Christ in the Old Testament, and we'll see some of that. And his brethren envied him. For what reason? They didn't have any. Jesus said, the Pharisees hated me without a cause. I've been hated a lot of times by people for no reason. But it's like, it's like David said when Shammai was throwing stones at him. He said, God hath bidden him to throw stones. Let him throw. But his father observed the saying, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem in northern Israel. And the Israel said unto Joseph, do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here I am, Father. He said, I want you to go to your brothers in Shechem. He has on that code of authority. That code of authority was given to men who were head of a company in the army. It was given to, it was given to men who were over uh, manufacturing or some kind of over a field where they're gathering sheaves. It was the one who was in charge. And his brothers are going to see him coming from a distance. And when they see him coming, they're going to start grinding their teeth together and go, Our Father has blessed him to be ruler over us. And boy, they're enraged. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, See whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron. Hebron is the further, furthest southern city in the Bible in Israel. Not now, but it was back then. And he came to Shechem, and a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, saying, what are you looking for? And Joseph said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed the flock. And the man said, they departed hence. He's fixing to walk into a trap simply because of the coat he's wearing. The word pos means a coat of lengths. It doesn't mean colors. The reason they put colors is because they took strips of material from various various particles of clothing and woven into one coat. So they called it a coat of colors, but it wasn't the coat of colors that Donny Osmond danced to in that Broadway play. It's not it. <laughs> Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. When they saw him afar off, that's why the Bible says afar off, they saw him a long distance. He had that coat on. They're just... Not because it was a pretty coat, and they, we'd want a coat pretty too. It's because one person got that authority, and he's 17, and he's wearing it. It had to come from his father, his father's favor. And they hated him the more for his... Where was I? 15. Oh, 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them... They conspired against him to kill him, all because of the coat. Not a beautiful coat. One that says, I'm going to be over the family. Remember I told you that among the Jews, one person would receive the inheritance. 
is Joseph. Remember Joseph later on, not later on, before this, over there in the in the 50, I'll get it right in a minute, in the 48th chapter of Genesis, Genesis 48. That's after, sometime after this, when, when Jacob ends up in Egypt, after Joseph is sold into Egypt because of his brother's envy, anger, rage, after he ends up in Egypt, and God settles them down there for the duration, Jacob and all of his sons and everyone's there. That's after all this adventure he has with his brothers. When he's over there, Jacob brings, he sees Joseph, and he says, bring your sons to me. And he had two sons. He had Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh was the, was the firstborn, firstborn. And Ephraim was the secondborn. Ephraim was second. And he brings these two sons to him. It was the custom of the Jews to bless the older son, and that would have been Manasseh in this case. Manasseh was a common name in Israel, like Bill or John here. There were a lot of several Manassehs in the scripture. There was one that was the most evil king that ever lived in Israel. But he was a believer later on. It just shows you Manasseh, the evil king, the son of Hezekiah, he's the one that we can see how evil a believer can be. He did more evil than all the kings that were before him. But this is a different Manasseh, so you've got to keep them separated. Manasseh was the firstborn, and Jacob calls for the two sons of Joseph. The two sons of Joseph, so he can bless them. There was a lesser blessing, and there was a greater blessing. The lesser blessing was given to the one that did not have the inheritance. And when you read that 48th chapter of Genesis, Jacob is sitting there. He's an old man. His eyes are dim for age. He cannot see well. So God has to be guiding him in what he's doing. And he brings... Joseph is coming to his father, and he brings Manasseh in his left hand. Whenever the right hand was placed upon a son, it couldn't be withdrawn. It was done. The, the, uh, the, the inheritance had been passed, and he guides his eldest son Manasseh to Jacob's right hand. It says Israel because his name was Israel. He was being called Israel. He brings him to his right hand because he wants Jacob. Joseph is not really know what's going on right now. And he brings his oldest son to Israel's right hand. So Manasseh will get the blessing of God and he'll inherit the kingdom. And he brings his second born son Ephraim in his right hand to Israel's left hand so he'll get the lesser blessing. When he gets close to him, Jacob does this. Wow. Just it's overwhelming to think of that. And J Joseph jumps back and said, Not so my father. Manasseh's my son, even my firstborn. And he said, I know that, son. The second born gets the blessing. Abel was second born. Jacob was second born. Jacob became Israel. You got second. David was the second king of Israel. The second birth gets the blessing, not this first birth. And any time you find those second borns having authority over the first borns, it was because that was God's will. You, and from then on, any time you find after Ephraim is dead and after Joseph is dead, northern Israel a lot of times will be referred to as Joseph. In fact, in the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, at the end of time, the Bible speaks of take one stick for Joseph. It says, Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. 
That's very easy to understand when you understand. Ephraim received the blessing of having the authority of Israel. And, and, he's, and the northern Israel is called Joseph. And then northern Israel is also called Samaria. Samaria at one time was one city there in northern Israel, but it adapted uh, later on to, being, to be all of it northern Israel. So it's called Samaria. It's called Israel after the split. And it was northern Israel, the ten northern tribes, that was led by Ephraim or Joseph. So that's the ten tribes. And the ten tribes never received the decrees to come back. Only the southern tribes, the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, received the decrees from the Persian Empire to come back and rebuild the temple in the city. So you have to have the... Whenever I've made this statement, in the first century, all of Israel was not back from the captivity, only the two southern tribes. Without the owner there, Joseph or Ephraim, they weren't, there wasn't anybody at home. The lights were out. They had to have Joseph or Ephraim. The inheritance belonged to Joseph through his son Ephraim, and the king comes from southern Judah. But they have to have all of it together, and that's what will happen at the end of time. Now, let's read some more of this. This is what envy does, but God works all things after the counsel of his own will, doesn't he? In everything give thanks, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The envy that comes from Joseph's brothers is going to work together for, for their good and for Joseph's good. Now, let's look at this at one more time. Now, what verse am I in? 19. They said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. They said, He's coming, and look what he's wearing. He's going to be our boss. And some of us are in our late 30s and early 40s. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands. That is amazing to me. Reuben is unstable as water. Reuben was the firstborn. God bypassed Reuben to give the, he should have been the priest and the king, and he should have had the inheritance. The firstborn was always that way. But he was so unstable as water that it was the prerogative of the owner to pass that out to who he will. So he goes to the, the, he goes to the thirdborn, Levi, and gives him the priesthood. It should have gone to Reuben if Reuben had had good sense. But God wanted that too. And then he went to the fourthborn, Judah, and gave him the kingship. And when we get to Saul, when we get to Saul, the first king of Israel, first man king, Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. That's the wrong tribe. Because the blessing of God was given to his sons in Genesis, the 49th chapter. That's right at the end of the book of Genesis. Jacob, or Israel, is lying on his deathbed. He says, bring my sons to me. I'm going to place the blessings or the curses upon them as they belong. If you notice, Simeon, somebody asked me the other day, what about Simeon? Is he with the southern tribes? No, he was numbered with northern Israel. I have my own theory about why Simeon is down here. Simeon was a liar. <laughs> That's the main reason I believe he's put in the middle of the southern Judah to keep him in line. He's the one that wanted to kill Shechem and Hamor when they came to Jacob and said, we'd like to marry your daughters. And Jacob said, if you will be circumcised, you can come into Israel and be our brothers. And they said, okay, we'll agree to that. And Simeon said, he went to Levi and said, hey, brother, let's get them. When they're cut and they can't move, let's kill them all. He was a murderer. And Jacob, when they did that and killed Hamar and killed Shechem, he, Simeon, 
was just a scoundrel. He was a rebellious son, and he was the second born of Jacob. Now, in that case, the second born is not blessed. But Simeon is in the middle of southern Judah. I believe God surrounded him with Judah so he would keep him at bay. Judah would. But during the kingdom, he is numbered with the ten northern tribes. The two southern tribes is Benjamin and Judah. That's the southern Judah. How they could do that is only God can know. Now let's get back to this. Let's get back to this. Where was I? Reuben said, Reuben heard it and he delivered Joseph out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. Huh? Okay, come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into the pit. And we will say to our father, Some evil beast has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. You sure will, won't they? That's really funny. We'll see what's going to become of his dreams. See if he can fulfill this now. No, but God can. And God does that. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto him, to unto them, Shed no blood. Notice this is all due to envy. I want what he's got. I don't know how they all thought they were going to divide it up among the 11 sons. Do you? How can you divide up that coat among 11 sons? Each one of them was selfish and full of envy, and they didn't care what happened to Joseph. And they shed no blood, but cast him into the pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand on him, that he may rid him out of their hands. We can get rid of him. If we can get rid of Jim Brown and kill him, you think God cannot sell him? The people said, let's kill Jeremiah. He's disheartening the people. He's walking through the streets of the city saying, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and slaughter us. If we get rid of Jeremiah, God doesn't know how to call an Ezekiel or a Daniel. I guess he does, doesn't he? Daniel was just a kid in Jerusalem when Jeremiah was walking through the gates of the city standing at the door of the city saying, Repent, Nebuchadnezzar's coming. Daniel says, I wonder what that's like. God says, Your turn will be here very soon. And Ezekiel was probably a teenager when Jeremiah was walking through the streets of the city because they came right after Daniel, or right after Jeremiah. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat of authority <laughs> That doesn't mean he's not going to be in authority because he's going to be in authority when he gets to Egypt. Stripped him of his coat of authority that was on him and they took him and cast him into the pit and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eye, eyes and looked and behold a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh and going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said, this is the fourth son, Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. They're going to carry him to Egypt where he's going to meet the Pharaoh and become second in charge. And his brothers are going to come and bow to him. And let not our hand be upon him, and he is our brother, and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then there passed by the Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned into the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes, and he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not. There's another illustration of is not. Something that was not was dead. He was saying that Joseph was dead. The child is not. See, he didn't know what the other guys had done. And I, whither I shall go, I took, they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood, and they sent the coat of many, not many. You notice that's in italics. That's not there. 
They sent the coat of authority, the pass, and they brought it unto their father and said, This have we found, know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces, and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days because he was his favorite child. And all of his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. And he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down to the grave unto my son, mourning that thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh's captain of the guard. He went to Egypt and went into one of the most important houses in Egypt, the head of Potiphar's house. Then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. The Bible says there in that 39th chapter, Joseph was very fair to look upon. He was very handsome. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife had to be a good-looking woman. Potiphar was high-ranking among Pharaoh. He was a good military man, knew how to command armies. Potiphar had his choice of women in Egypt. He was like all other men. He found the best-looking woman that didn't have good sense. <laughs> and she tried to seduce Joseph when she got him into the household in that 39th chapter. When he, she tried to seduce him, Joseph said, I cannot do this and sin against God. He pulled away from her. She had a hold of his coat, and then she started crying, Rape! Rape! They come and got Joseph. Now, the custom was when you messed with another man's wife, especially the captain of the guard, you had to die for that. There's only one thing. Potiphar knew his wife, and Potiphar loved Joseph. So instead of putting Joseph to death, he put him in prison. Now, what did Joseph do? Did he get angry and say, I don't deserve to be here, kind of like Jesus on the cross. I don't deserve to be having to die on this cross. No. He applied himself to wherever God put him. He got into prison, and he was so responsible, that made him the chief turnkey. A turnkey was the man who held the keys and the locks, and he took care of the prison. And while he was in prison, he just was honorable, and everybody could see that. Potiphar could see that. The keepers of the prison could see that. And that's when two men came to him. One was Pharaoh's baker, and the other was his cupbearer. And when he came in, when these two men come to Joseph, they said, we hear you can interpret dreams. He said, I don't do that. God does that. And the baker says, uh, the butler says, the butler butler was a cup bearer, one that brought the cup to him. Anytime you had a cup bearer, that's what Nehemiah was to Artaxerxes. A cup bearer was the most trusted man as far as the ruler was concerned. He would bring him the drinks, grape juice, and he would sip it first, and if he fell dead, the, the king wouldn't drink it. That's what he was for, to check whether somebody was trying to overthrow him or not. Well, he tells the butler, you're going to be delivered in three days. And the baker says, a little bit of a story to that. You can read that in the 41st chapter of Genesis. You can read that. And he, the, butler, the baker comes to him and says, what about me? He says, well, the... the uh, Pharaoh's going to take you and hang you in three days. And that happened, and the, then the butler leaves the prison. He's restored to his former position. And, he, and Joseph tells him when he leaves the prison, don't forget me, and he does, but that was also ordained by God. He had to forget Joseph in prison doing the good things he did until Pharaoh has two dreams. He has a dream about some good cattle going, seven good cattle going down into a river and seven bad cattle coming up. 
Then he has another dream, two witnesses again, about some good corn and then some bad corn for seven ears of corn. And the Pharaoh tries to get all the Chaldeans, which are the magicians of Babylon, to tell him what this dream means. And then the cupbearer says, I, my mind has left me. I've forgotten this. There's a Hebrew in prison that he knows all about dreams. And Pharaoh said, well, I would do anything till you bring him here. Well, they bring Joseph. And Joseph said, it's not me that does dreams. It's God. He'll interpret the dreams. So the Pharaoh says, what does this mean? He said, the two dreams are the same. He said, you're going to have seven good years, and then you're going to have seven bad years. You need to have an honorable man to step forward and to handle all this grain for seven years and put it up so you'll have, have grain to go through the following seven years. And the Pharaoh said, who but a man here that would not bow to me? We're going to put this man, this man Joseph, is going to be head of all of Egypt except for my own household. If whatever he says, I'm going to give him to my ring that's got my, it's got my stamp and my seal up on it, and you will, everybody in Egypt will do what he says. You got that? Boy, now he's in charge. And then the famine goes throughout the land. They're over here in Egypt. And the famine covers Egypt and covers all of Israel. And his brothers, they think he's dead somewhere. And they come over to Egypt. God sends the brothers over. There are ten of them that come. The one stays at home because Joseph, J Jacob is not going to let Benjamin, the youngest son of his beloved Rachel, out of his sight. He thinks Joseph is dead, the other son of Rachel. And he says, I'm not going to leave him out of my sight. You can't take him to Egypt. So they go over there to get grain. And they get over there, and we, hear, we know the story, how that uh, Joseph accuses them of being spies. He accuses them of being spies. All of this is because of their envy. It's their envy produced the goodness of God in Israel and their lives. And Joseph, Joseph becomes, head of, becomes head of Egypt, second in charge of all of Egypt, and he's the man in Egypt that his brothers go to. And he speaks to his brothers through an interpreter, and they don't know that's Joseph. And they don't feel guilty about nothing for having done what they did. But they're over there in Egypt bowing to this man of Egypt, like the dreams in the 37th chapter said they would. And God has raised up Joseph to be this wonderful leader of men. Joseph, Joseph sends them back home. He says, but I want one of you to stay here with me. And he pointed at Simeon. I want him. Joseph was the 11th son, and he wants the second born, 11 and 2. I talked about that a week or so ago, 11 and 2. You got 11 and 2 all through the Bible. So he stayed, and they thought he was going to be beaten or whipped, and they get back over here, they get back over to Israel, eat up all the grain. But Joseph had told them, but they didn't know it was Joseph. He had told them, don't come back without your little brother. And, jo and it's time to go get more grain. And they say, Father, Judas says, Father, we have to take Benjamin with us. He says, no, I can't lose my youngest son of Rachel. I can't lose him. Finally, they convinced Jacob he's got to go. They're not going to give us grain without him there. And they go back. And it's a long story. Joseph plants his divining cup, as all the Egyptians had one, in the sack of Benjamin on the way back. And he calls them before him. 
And he says, aha, you thieves and you stole my cup. They didn't steal it. Joseph planted it there. And it comes time for him to reveal himself to his brothers. Let's go over here to Genesis. The 46th chapter. Let me see here. I want to read some. Let me go to 45th chapter. And he's meeting with his brothers. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. I want to keep reminding you, this was jealousy, envy over his dreams. Envy, you may be fulfilling, well, you will be fulfilling the will of God when you're involved in your envy, and you'll get corrected like Joseph is, is about to tell his brothers. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried, cause every man to go out from me. It was against Egyptian law for an Egyptian to be found alone in a house with a bunch of heathens, and they considered the Hebrews heathens. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. Egyptians... He wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard him weeping in there with his brothers. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. First time they heard that, they were terrified. They didn't know who this Egyptian was that they were talking to. It was their brother. I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? I love the next sentence. And his brethren could not answer him. They're going, ah, ah, ah. For they were troubled at his presence. I guess they were. Could they be anything else but troubled at the presence of Joseph? They all thought he's dead. Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me. I pray you. And they came near and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt because of your envy and your hatred of me. And they're bowing to him. And the, the bowing of the sheaves to Joseph's sheep is taking place right here. Now therefore be not grief nor anger with yourselves, that you sold me hither in all of your rage and fury and anger, and you wanted to kill me. Don't be angry with yourselves, for God did send me before you to preserve life. You didn't do this. God did this. Boy, that's overwhelming to realize how God uses the evil works of men to bring about his righteousness. For these two years hath the famine been in the land. So they've had five good years. They've had two bad years. They've got five more bad years to go, don't they? Five more years of famine. And yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring or nor harvest. God sent me before you. Notice he keeps saying, God did the sending. He manipulated the evil in your minds to cause you to sell me. They had to be thinking the evil they were thinking in order for God's plan to come about. So when people give me a hard time, God is bidding you to throw stones. Go ahead, throw stones. God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. He's not just talking about bringing them to Egypt. He's talking about 400 years later, he's going to deliver them out of the hands of Pharaoh and out of Egypt. Now, therefore, it was not you that put me here in Egypt. Do you understand the sovereignty of God? 
Look at the evil that's going on. It wasn't you that did this, he said. It was God in your minds to do evil to me, to get me over here so I could rise in Egypt to save Israel. He's, he never complained about one thing that happened. He just bowed to the will of God. It was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and the ruler over all the land of Egypt. Whatever is happening in your life, is the, it's the will of God. You're going to have to wait for God to do the things that he does. You can't rise all of a sudden and be the important person you think you need to be today. Can you? I, I've said this a thousand times, but I never would have believed when I was just a kid out of high school driving a laundry truck in Beaumont, Texas, a little dinky truck making about $45 a week, that I'd be standing in the pulpit teaching from the Greek text in my 50s and 60s. It's not possible. I'd have said, you're crazy if you said that. <laughs> now, go over here at the very end of the book. Go to the 50th chapter. Jacob has died in the 49th chapter. He called all of his sons around him, and he gives them their blessings and their cursings. He starts with Reuben in verse 3 of chapter 49. And the Bible says, well, let me just show you a verse in 48. 48 is where he puts his right hand on the head, crosses his hands, puts his right hand upon the head of Ephraim so he'll get the inheritance. And all the way through the rest of the Old Testament, when Hosea mentions Ephraim and he talks about the curses upon Ephraim, he's talking about northern Israel. Well, Ephraim's ruling all of the northern Israel and he has the inheritance. And when Hosea's talking about Ephraim, each one of those prophets will tell you who they're preaching against. Hosea was preaching against Ephraim. Why? Why was he preaching against Ephraim? Well, that's not hard to figure out. Ephraim is northern Israel, isn't it? And there was a king in northern Israel named Ahab. Ahab marries Jezebel, the Phoenician princess from Tyre and Sidon. And she brings all of her gods down into northern Israel, Baal and the grove, and they begin to worship that. That's why Hosea is preaching against Ephraim, because that's northern Israel. Ahab was the king of Ephraim, or the king of northern Israel. That's what he was. These are, this is the lineage of the kings here on the left-hand page. This is the lineage of David, Solomon, and all of these are of the tribe of Judah, except for Athaliah, who was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And she brought their gods down here when she married King Jehoram. And then she goes out and kills all of the seed royal of the king so she could have the kingdom. If there's ever a witch in the Bible, people talk about Jezebel. Athaliah was the most evil, wicked, godless woman that ever lived. I mean, she's, a, she's one that you want to see. God sent her to hell, and when you do, we're all going to clap. Because she was godless. She went out and killed all the seed royal. And then she became the king. Well, she thought she got all of them except one, Joash. When Joash got of age, the priest brought him out and said, God save King Joash. And he, she went, oh, treason. She, she's crying treason. And she's murdered all these sons of her husband, Jehoram. What a... How, I can't even understand somebody having that kind of thinking. But it was all the will of God, wasn't it? And when the Bible says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver in between his feet, there in the 49th chapter of Genesis, when Jacob is blessing and cursing the various sons, she couldn't have got all the seed royal. There's no way. 
because of that verse. The seed will never depart from Judah. She wanted to kill all of the seeds, anybody that can inherit Judah. She wanted to kill them. She got them all but Joash. And he wasn't the greatest king, but he had the seed of Judah in him. And he kept, and he, his son Amaziah serves after him, and then Uzziah his son, and then Jotham his son, and all the way down to Zedekiah, the last king of southern Judah. Now, go over here to the last chapter of, well, let's look here at Genesis, the 49th chapter. It's time for Jacob to die. Look at verse 21 of chapter 48. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. Israel is Jacob, remember? But God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given you, given thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Chapter 49, Jacob said unto his sons, and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. I want to talk about the last days tonight. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob. Hearken unto Israel your father. At the end of Jacob's life, he keeps being referred to as Israel, the father of these 12 sons. Reuben, you're the firstborn, you're unstable as water. You don't have any place in the kingdom. Then you got Simeon and Levi, brethren, instruments of cruelty, or their habitation. You went out and murdered uh, Hamor and Shechem and all the rest of their family. You murdered them when they were bleeding from their circumcision because they couldn't move. You took advantage. Jacob said, you're a disgrace. <laughs> this is what gets me. Here's Israel in the making, right? Right? The Bible says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And people will say, well, let's talk about nations. Let me tell you, while Israel was in the making, there was some evil going on in Israel. Before either one had done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand. The scripture says, God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Jacob was Israel, and Israel's in the making, and there's two evil men right here, Simeon and Levi. And Simeon was the, he was the head of that uprising. He's the guy that brought it about. So God says, i got to corral Simeon. He's got an evil streak in him. Now, so you get on down through here. He says in verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. He's going through all 12 sons. And he says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the, prey, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. As an old lion, he shall, who shall rouse up Judah? And the scepter shall not depart from Judah, the fourthborn of Jacob, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until shallow come. Unto him, unto Judah, will all the gathering of the people be, because out of him will come the king. And David is of the tribe of Judah, and Jesus is the lion of Judah. He's the lion of Judah. Now let's go. Let's look at the last chapter here. Jacob dies in this chapter right here. He dies. They take him and they bury him. He's in Egypt. Because that's where Joseph brought him and all of his family. Brought him to Egypt. Jacob dies. And Joseph's brothers are scared of him. They think, oh my gosh, our father's dead. And the only reason Joseph has saved our life to this point is because our father was alive and loved him. But now he's going to hurt us. And so they make up a story and send it to Joseph. Now here at the end of this chapter, chapter 50, when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly require us all the evil which we did unto him. He's going to get us back and get revenge. 
true believer won't look for revenge. Vengeance is mine. I will repay thus, saith the Lord. It belongs to me. It doesn't belong to you to get people back. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, This is one of the biblical lies. They're lying through their teeth. They're trying to save their life. That's what they're doing. Our father said, And so shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive your brothers, I pray thee now, and the trespass of thy brethren and their sin when they sold you into Egypt. Forgive them. And he said, You didn't send me here. God sent me before you to preserve life. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee. Joseph, Jacob didn't say any of this. They're making this up. You see that? Now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy family. And Joseph wept. He broke his heart. Don't you know that God's put me over here? He used your evil mind and your evil thoughts and your jealousy and your envy to get me here to save your life? To save much people alive when there's an exodus 400 years later at the hand of Moses? And they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we're your servants, Joseph. There's another fulfillment of, of their sheaves bowing down to his sheaf. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me when you did it. But God meant it unto good all that evil you did God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive see that word thought what they thought and see the word meant they're both the same word Koshab, C-H-A-S-H-A-B C-H-A-S-H-A-B when you try to understand the will of God, don't try to understand it. Just believe it. That word koshal means to plat together. God took their evil minds. I think of platting. I think of weaving plastic or threads or together to form a picture. God says, it means to interpenetrate, to arrange a design. Understanding the will of God. It means to weave or fabricate. God took their, their minds, put evil in their minds, caused them to sell Joseph into Egypt so that he could rise to the top of Egypt. And God was in charge of every move. When the when the butler forgot Joseph was in prison, God arranged for him to forget. Because if he'd have remembered, he would have brought Joseph out before the Pharaoh had his dream, and he'd be forgotten. It had to be at the right time when the Pharaoh was having his dream, and no one can interpret it except this Hebrew in prison. The butler had to forget. There's no way around it. Everything in our lives, it's an interpenetrating, interpenetrating work of God. He works all things after the counts of his own will. In everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Does anybody have anything that's happened this past week that you don't want to be thankful for? Has anybody had a ticket? Has anybody had a car wreck? If you have a car wreck, Every step of your life will be different. And then you'll get five years down the road and something will happen. You'll say, this is the will of God, but not without that car wreck. If you get a ticket, the police officer will delay you 10 to 15 minutes. Every move in your life, every move in that day will be different than if you'd have gone ahead and done what you were going to do. Everything is God's orderly arrangement. He works all things after the counts of His own will. Every evil thing in your life 
I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. If we could get that in our heads, we can learn something. We can learn the spiritual Sabbath. The spiritual Sabbath. That's when you start believing God for everything. You don't believe Him for it. You believe He's doing it. He's doing everything. Does anybody have any problems with some part of your life? Do you have some worker that you're working with that you don't like? I'll bet you a lot of that goes on here, isn't it? You have somebody you just hate to see and hate to meet? I'll tell you how you get rid of them. Start learning these words and give them some Greek words. And they'll see you coming and go, oh, Hey, Ron, it's good to see you, but i got to go. They'll act like... They'll act like you've got some kind of poison or something. They'll get away from you. The thing, the way you defend yourself, you don't have to point a finger at anybody and condemn them. All you do is give them the Word of God. It's all His will. I found that the best way I can defend myself is just give people the truth. And they want to get away from me if they don't believe. Now, I hope you can see there in verse 21, And therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. <laughs> They're scared to death. Joseph is going to kill them. He says, Don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of you. I'm your little brother. But I'm here. I'm going to look after you. I'm going to take care of your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. After they sang, Well, you're going to you're going to kill us. No, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to feed you and take care of you and pay your rent. How you like that? <laughs> I think this is one of the greatest stories in all the Bible. This is about envy. Envy paid off. People's envy is going to pay off. If it doesn't teach them something, it'll teach me something. It'll teach me not to envy. Envy is a, it's a poison. It's what it is. I got a couple of verses on envy I want to read to you. It's people, people don't know that what you're doing is producing your life. We somehow think we're in charge because we can will to do something. You're not in charge of anything, nothing. If God gave you to the ability to will in the flesh, whatever you will is the will of God. If it, if it follows through, if you will to do something and it happens, that was the will of God long before it was your will. People think that the will of God starts with them being willing. You can't be willing to, to believe God. There's none that seeketh after God. How are you willing? Psalms 110, 3 says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Only when God brings His power upon your life are you willing to do the will of God. And the will of God will not always be what looks good in your life. It'll look like Joseph's brothers. That's what it'll look like. Now, gosh, let me give you a couple of things on envy. Look at Proverbs 3 and 31. Proverbs 3. I think that envy, pride, and anger, and the orgay, the orgay is the wrath of covetousness when a person is, wants his way and he wants to get somebody back. These are some of the evil words that are in the Bible that you don't want to be involved in. You want to say, Lord, the only reason you want your way is because that's the flesh, that's the outer person. We need to be looking on the things of others and caring about other people and not ourselves. Look here in Proverbs 3. I'm just going to read you a couple of verses on, on envy. And this is the word kinah. Q-I-N-A-H. It means envy or to make zealous. Q-I-N-A-H. It means to make envious or to to heat up 
it's, it's equivalent to the word in the New Testament, zealous. Now, zealous can be good or evil. It means to be hated. We're to be zealous of good works. We're supposed to be high on the heat of our body. I want to do this for God instead of I want to do this for myself. You're either going to want to do for self or do for God. You should question yourself on everything you do. Look here in Proverbs. Proverbs, let's read some things about envy. Proverbs, four, Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3 and verse 31. 31. But if Proverbs 3 and 31, I'll get it in a minute. I'm in Proverbs 6. That's why I couldn't find it. All right. Proverbs 3, 31. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the froward is abomination to the Lord. The Bible says when a man that's envious is froward. Froward, in this case, is the word lose, L-U-W-Z. Envy is twisted. It's perverted. It can't think right. It always thinks for self, I want my way, and I'm going to get that guy for taking my glory. Well, the Bible says nobody is to glory in the sight of God. I love that verse in the seventh chapter, or fourth chapter, First Corinthians, when the Bible says, "What dost thou have that thou didst not receive, or who maketh thee to differ from another?" If God gives a person talent to ascend up the ladder in the business world and didn't give you that, they were given that ability by God. And even if they're a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, they still have that ability. You're not supposed to be envying them or anyone else about anything they have or anything they're doing. It's a hard, I think envy is the hardest thing for a man to overcome because envy ends up in orge. Orge is feminine gender. It's the wrath of covetousness. It's wanting to get revenge on people for what they did to you and what they stole from you, and I deserve that glory. Well, the Scripture goes on to say, who makes you to differ from another? If you're good looking, who made that? If you're glib, who made that? That's right. If you have any talent whatsoever, any money, or anything in your life, what made that in your life? God made that in your life. And if somebody else has something that... I've found that when anybody excels, when anybody excels in life, people want to give you a hard time. They're envious. The world is envious. I found that out in the music business. I found that out in the real estate business. People want to give you a hard time because you're in front of them, they seem to think. They're wherever God put them. You have to be thankful. If you're in life, wherever you are, that's where God wants you to be. But he doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to make progress. Look here in, look over here in, if you're froward, you're twisting the Word of God. There's about 12 words for froward. In fact, you can take this envy that a man has and you can transfer it everywhere there's froward because the envy, the man full of envy has a twisted way of understanding. In fact, you look at Proverbs 2 and 12. Uh, when wisdom entereth into thine heart, he enters your heart. These are the things that happen to you there from verse 10. Knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. He speaks twisted things. 
who have who laved the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in frowardness, twistedness. They like the twisting of things. That's a different word. Topuka, T O P U C U K A H, T O P U K A H. But it has the basic same meaning as the as the other word we just gave you. It means perverted. Then he says in verse fifteen, whose ways are crooked, and they they froward in their paths. They're twisted in the where they walk. If you go, if you envy the wrong person, you'll be wanting to follow their ways. The Bible says, "Make no friendship with an anger man, lest thou learn his ways." He's angry with God, and he gets a snare to his soul. Don't want what somebody else got. You've got what God wants you to have: the mind and everything else. Now, look here in Proverbs 14, verse 30. Proverbs 14, verse 30. This, the Proverbs, the Psalms, and Ecclesiastes will tell you the condition of a man when you look up the words there. Proverbs 14 and 30. 14, 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. You remember we said that word, Fathero means to be rotten in your thinking. When you're envious, you're rotten in your thinking. Your thinking is not straight. When you want what you think you're supposed to have, you can envy without having any particular person in mind. You can just simply say, I think I deserve more than I've got. You're envious when you look around in life and see people with all these things that you want. That's the outer man. <coughs> Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. When he said that, in Philippians, the fourth chapter, Philippians was a prison epistle. He was in prison waiting to be beheaded when he said, I have learned. Manthano comes from the word to teach, Mathituo, and that comes from the word disciple, a learner. Mathetes. He said, I've learned to be content being in prison, waiting to have my head cut off. I'm content. Whew. That's how's that? How can you be content? Well, the word content there is the word A U T A R K E S. Autarkes is made up of auto. And archaeo. Auto is self. And archaeo means to push away. To ward off self. He said, I'm ready to die. If you're not, when you're time to die, and you haven't learned to push self away, you have got some terrible way to face eternity. The sooner you can learn to push self away, the better off you're going to be because everything is the way God wants it in your life. Was it, if anybody had a right to complain, would Joseph have had a right to complain? Why didn't he? Joseph knew something that we didn't know. He knew that he was in the middle of the will of God while he was in prison. While he was being seduced by Potiphar's wife, he knew this is supposed to be. He knew he was there for God's purpose. And he rose up and became the ruler of Egypt. Look here. Let me give you a couple more of these things. Look at Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. I just like to read these things out of Proverbs. 23 and verse 17. Let not thine heart envy sinners. Man out here, he's running high and he's high rolling and he's sinful be thou, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all day long. You have no fear of God if you're out here wanting somebody else's stuff and things. And look here in Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27 
and verse 4. 27 and 4. 27 and 4. Wrath is cruel. Kima. C-H-E-M-A-H. Anger. Poison. Rage. Anger is poison. Rage. It means rage that is poisonous when you're angry. That's the kind of wrath it's talking about here. Wrath is poisonous. Wrath is cruel. And anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? Envy, when people are envying you, they're going to try to destroy you just like they did Joseph. But when you are in the will of God, you know you're doing what God wants you to do. You don't need to be afraid of these people at all. What we need to learn is learn that God is doing everything. Now, do I have any time, Mike? Oh, man, I'm not going to get anywhere on this. I was going to bring up Saul to you. Go back over here to 1 Samuel. If anyone was angry and envious in the Old Testament, it was King Saul. He was wanting to kill David. Let me kind of give you a real quick rundown of what's happening with Saul. Saul was evidently a good man when when God picked him out to be king of Israel. But God picked Saul out of the wrong tribe. The king wouldn't come out of Benjamin, the twelfth son of Jacob. I keep telling you this. The king has to come out of Judah. And when the people are murmuring for a king, they're in the eighth chapter. They don't like the fact that Samuel has got two sons, Joel and Abiah, and these guys are wicked sons. How could Joseph, how could Samuel have wicked sons? Well, some men will spend their time on preaching and being a prophet, and they won't take care of their family at home. Evidently, Samuel failed with his children, just like, just like Eli. In the, first, in the second chapter of First Samuel, Eli's the high priest in Israel, and Eli's got two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that are wicked. How can a good man like Eli have sons that are wicked? That's a good question. Now, in First Samuel, the eighth chapter, the people said, give us a king to rule over us. God was their king. We want a man king to rule us. God says, all right. He sends Samuel, tells him, if you have a man king, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to end up with your daughters being in the palace, being bakers, confectioners, and you won't ever see them. Your sons will be out at war, in battle, and you'll never see them. They'll be running before chariots. The king would have 50 men running in front of his chariot when he went into battle. Samuel says, is that what you want? You've got God as a king right now. All you're going to have is a bunch of men with spears and bows and arrows. God has a better arsenal than that. God's got fire from heaven. He's got earthquakes. He's got floods. He can fight anyone and win. They said, we still want a king. He said, all right. So God picks out a king. In chapter 9, there was a man of Benjamin. Boy, there's the key right there. There was a man of Benjamin. Saul's going to come out of this man of Benjamin. It's the wrong tribe to have a king in it. Whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekroth, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul. We're not, you got Saul of the New Testament who became Paul. And this Saul in the Old Testament, was he was, a, 
he was a believer. He was the anointed king of Israel. But he never behaves himself. He never does right. So Samuel goes looking for Saul, a choice young man and goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than Saul. Now he's going to end up chasing David all over Israel, trying to kill him because of envy. Because he's going to say, you stole my kingdom from me. He hadn't stolen nothing. It was the will of God, just like with Joseph. It's the will of God that Saul is not the king of Israel. When you see he's of the tribe of Benjamin, you suspect something. The king don't come out of Benjamin. Not legally, does it? So when Saul gets bent out of shape in that 11th chapter, and he goes into his first battle against Nahas the Ammonite, he loses his temper and gets crazy. And he starts a bad reign as king from the 13th, 14th, 15th chapter of 1 Samuel. He don't do right ever. And then God says, I've had it with you. Samuel tell him his day is over and he's not going to be king anymore. And Samuel, you go down to the house of Jesse in southern Judah. And you're going to find a king among the sons of Jesse. And he goes down, the, he goes down there. Saul is trying to hold on to the kingdom. Saul is the king up to the 13th, 14th, 15th chapter of 1 Samuel. And then in the 16th chapter, Saul is king, 1 Samuel 13 through 15. In chapter 15, Saul does something just crazy. He's been ignoring God through the 13th and the 14th chapter, what God tells him to do. Tells him in the 13th chapter, go to Gilgal and wait for me. I'll be there in seven days. Saul waits six and a half days and runs around he sees that the Philistines have got thousands of soldiers. We've got to do something right now. So he goes and gets a priest and offers a sacrifice to God. And Samuel isn't there yet. This is one of the first times he goofs off. And he just, Saul is very childish. He's the tallest man in Israel. You don't need a guy strapping tall, big, huge monsters. You don't need that. You need a man's heart that works for God. That's all God wants from us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to give your bodies a living sacrifice. That's all he wants. Bodies laid down for him. Now, Saul, he doesn't do the will of God in the 14th chapter. Samuel jumps his case about not waiting for him. And he said, you were supposed to wait for me. And he doesn't. Gilgal was right in the center of Israel. There were soldiers all over Israel, foreign soldiers all the time because Israel hadn't driven them out when they first came in to reclaim the land. So they all had to gather at a central point. Gilgal was right in the center of Israel. He said, you go to Gilgal and wait for me. Don't you do nothing till I get there. He always had... Saul was always one step ahead of himself. He's always ahead of God. And in that 15th chapter, God says, I've had my fill of Saul. And he's going to go get a king that's going to make Saul so jealous, so envious. It's going to be David. He gets down there to, Samuel gets down to southern Judah. The Lord told him, go to Bethlehem, Judah. I've chosen me a king among the sons of Jesse. So he gets down to Bethlehem, Judah. And they are so afraid of the prophets. They meet him at the gate of the city. Said, the people are scared to death of the prophets. They know they can call fire from heaven. And they meet Samuel out at the edge of the city and go, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You, you don't belong here. Why are you here? And he said, well, I came down to serve God. 
And he said, I need to go to the house of Jesse. So he goes to Jesse's house. And he said, Jesse, God has sent me here. One of your sons is going to be king of Israel. Now Saul is up northern Israel. He still thinks he's king. All the way to the end of the book, Saul thinks he's king. In the eyes of God, David is anointed by Samuel in the 16th chapter. So you got two kings of Israel. One that God picked. God picked Saul, but he's the wrong king, wrong tribe. And the righteous king will be David, and the unrighteous king will be Saul. And all the way to the end of the book, Saul is chasing David from the 19th chapter through the 31st chapter. All of those chapters are about Saul trying to find David and to kill him. You'd think that Saul would catch on because David trapped him twice. He trapped him once in a cave and... David was inside the cave and he clipped off a piece of his robe and he got outside the cave later and he held the piece of the robe up and said, Abner, you're the commander of northern Israel. Why have you let you, this is your king's robe. You're not doing your duty and doing what you're supposed to do, looking after King Saul. David was looking out for King Saul while Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him. And Saul and Absalom, not Absalom, Adonijah, David's nephew, by his sister Zeruiah, Absalom has always wanted to kill Saul when he got close to him. God said, he is the, David said, he is the anointed of the Lord. Don't you dare touch him. People say, well, did Saul go to heaven? Well, he had to. Because right before he goes to his last battle at Mount Gilboa, he says, I've got to get some advice. I need to see a witch. And he goes to the witch of Endor. I'm sure we got the word Endor off of bewitched from that. And he goes to the witch of Endor. He said, what's going to happen? I need to, I need to, uh, con I need you to conjure up Samuel. Well, she can't conjure up Samuel. Samuel's been dead for two years. So God conjures up Samuel in front of Saul. And the witch goes, ah! I, I can't do that! And Samuel stands there in front of Saul and says, Tomorrow, you're going into battle at Gilboa. And you and your sons are going to die and be with me. That's what, that's what Samuel tells Saul. He says, you're going to die tomorrow. You're coming to be with me. And the next day, Saul falls on his sword, kills himself. If he doesn't go to be with, with Samuel, then the Bible's a lie. It's not suicide that sends you to hell. It's, it's unrepentance of the inner man. The outer man won't ever, you'll never get rid of that outer man totally until you die. I've run out of time. What I need to do is come back next week and take you through Saul and David's life and show you how that Saul was so envious of David, tried to kill him at every turn from the 19th chapter to the 31st chapter, and finally, finally Saul goes into battle and he dies. His envy ends up in his own death. That's what can happen to, and he was a believer. David called him the anointed of the Lord. And he'd tell Abishai, don't you touch him. God made him king. I'm not going to touch him. David never did. God dealt with Saul through the Philistines. I'll come back next week. We'll resume this story of Saul and the story of envy. Envy is a deadly poison. That's something we don't want to be involved in. And that's something every person is involved in. And that's one of the big major sins that believers have to overcome is being envious and prideful and want what is not theirs. Remember, 
Any man in position, God put him there. Even the evil ones. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your truth. God, help us to get rid of all envy and strife. And Lord, you've pretty much wiped that out of my life, I guess because of my age and all my experience. I really thank you for it because I've learned as I grow older it's the only way to live. Thank you for truth. Crush us under your hand. Help the people in the church to grow spiritually. Teach them the poison of envy, of rage and anger. That that goes nowhere in our life. Thank you for truth. Lead us to your elect family. We'll praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. I wish I could have got further into this, but I'll have to do that next week. Judy, Judy, Judy. Was David 17 as well? Huh? Was David 17 as a shepherd? Well, he was younger than 20 because he couldn't be in Saul's army. Okay, but it doesn't give his age. He was a shepherd boy. And, but he was very, would have been a great soldier because he was very adept with the sling and that rod that he carried with him. He said, I killed. When he goes over there to confront Goliath, he tells Saul, I haven't proven your armor, but I have this sling that I've proven, and I have this rod that I killed a bear with, and I killed a lion with it. So he wasn't some skinny weakling. David was a very formidable warrior. Just, hey. One heck of a message, Jim. I love you, brother. If we can get out of our envy, that took me a long time to get out of that. You know what? Something dawned on me. What's that? Remember how I told you one of my guys quit? Yeah. He did the same thing people do when they leave the ministry. Made up a story about you? Well, not so much a story, but just I, just a couple weeks before, he, he lost his keys to his van. So I, I paid for a locksmith to come out and yeah. fix it. I would buy him lunches. All of a sudden, he got in his head that I was treating him unfairly. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? But, but people do that. He just made it up because he really wanted to go out and get more. Well, you know? you, we got to understand, God didn't make everybody mature, did he? But if he wanted to go out and try to get more money, he could have just come and said, I appreciate everything you've done, but I, I want to try to get some more money. Yeah, if he'd but have he said that. Do that. Yeah, I, I, know, I know how people are. Yeah. They want to blame you for their failings. Yeah. And that's true. They wanted to, Saul wanted to blame David for God making him king. That's crazy. And, and, Joseph's brothers want to blame him for Jacob and God making him the ruler. It's like when, when God makes you something, just be thankful and keep going. And you're going to catch flack. That's the way it works. That's the way being a leader works. Be glad you're not in politics, you're not in the army or something. Well, you see that too, right? the best sports guys catching flack, the best whatever it is. Yeah. It's envy. It's envy is what it is. I don't care if they're sinners. I just don't want anything to do with them. But sitting around trying to figure people out and trying to make enemies of people, that's crazy. You know? I love you, man. I like it when you get into the stories of the Old Testament. Characters. Yeah, I'm going to stay in that because the people don't realize 
what is going on in the Old Testament is examples to us. Oh gosh, yeah, they did. Those people were any different than us. They were just like us. Hey, what are y'all doing? Hey, Ron.